All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Carl Charter, co-founder and chief executive experience in Marine Sanctuaries, known as EMS. Welcome everyone to tonight's live presentation, Cryptic Critters of South Australian Waters with guest presenter, Janine Baker. The second broadcast experience in Marine Sanctuaries live series, Marine Life Through Art Imagery. I hope you're all staying warm and safe at home during this cold weather and the COVID lockdown. I think you're sure to sit back, have a red wine, join Janine for this incredible talk. But I'd like to start with acknowledgement of country. Experience in Marine Sanctuaries acknowledges that we're tonight meeting on the traditional country of Ghana people at, on the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and sea. We acknowledge that they are continuing, they are continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Apologies to those who attempted to join us last week. Uh, we did have some technical issues last week, so uh, we're just yeah, keeping fingers crossed today that um, yeah, things go smoothly. Uh, tonight we're also cross-posting to a few other um, Facebook pages, um, including Marine Life Society of South Australia, uh, Ocean Imaging, Force of Nature Facebook pages. So welcome everyone from those communities as well. Uh, this is Experience in Marine Sanctuaries live presentation series with coordination and event management services provided by Force of Nature. I'd like to thank artists and science, sorry, scientists and artists for their in-kind and paid contributions and a big thank you to Inspiring SA and Green Adelaide for funding support. Thank you to everyone who makes this series possible. Okay, tonight's presentation is well-known marine ecologist Janine Baker. Janine Baker, also known as Marine Janine, has worked in marine research for more than 30 years for government agencies, universities, research organisations, NGOs, and as a sole trader. Her work has included mathematical modelling of fishery stocks, marine species conservation assessments, and surveys of seafloor cover and marine species. Janine currently has a two-part, sorry, a two-part, two part-time careers, one in citizen science and the other in primary special education. Janine has written many books and chapters on marine species in South Australia and delivered many, many marine presentations and worktop, workshops across South Australia. Janine also writes creatively and much of her poetry has been published over the past 20 years. That's a, that was a bit, bit of a mouthful, Janine. It's a big career you've had and it's still still going strong. Still going, um, yeah. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I call you the mother of marine parks. I've known Janine for about 20 years now through Reef Watch and other positions. <laughs> and without um, Janine, uh, there wouldn't be marine parks in South Australia, I doubt. Uh, tonight's presentation <laughs> include artworks from Wildcard Sue, Leela Fletcher, Camilo yeah. Asparza, Dan Monso and Emma Monso. It includes paintings, block prints, sculptures, collages and glass. The artwork is as varied as the South Australian marine life it represents. More entries for the series are invited. There's no entry fee and artists are offered a small placement fee if their art, artwork is selected. Artists are welcome to send expressions of interest to participate in these talks in the EMS Totally Immersed event. I will make the event I'll make this uh, link available in our comments on both the Zoom call and on the Facebook Live. Okay, so selected artworks will also feature the Totally Immersed, an end of year real life art exhibition in, in celebration of South Australian marine life and through art, video, virtual reality experience and marine science education. The exhibition venue and, and dates will be announced soon. Dan and Force of Nature is with us tonight. And if we have time after the presentation, I'm sure Jan's, uh, sorry, Dan's going to be quite happy to answer questions about that. I'll put that uh, link up on the comments book in a minute. Um, you'll be able to click through and express interest. So thank you. And I'll now hand over to Janine Baker to share her screen and uh, do her presentation. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. And thank you for tuning in this evening. Uh, for our presentation about marine critters in South Australian waters. And thank you to EMS and Force of Nature uh, for behind the scenes work in making this happen as well. So, um, firstly, like to play a little GIF here. I don't know who made this GIF, I got it from Jiffy Cat, but it's a wonderful example of a cryptic critter. And there are many of these kind of flatfishes in South Australian waters. So I just want to play this because it shows some of the wonderful features of an animal that is trying to hide itself and not be very obvious. So flat, uh, partly buried under the sand. You can see um, 
this particular flounder breathing away there and it's also got those eyes that can rotate that's a really neat trick uh, very useful to see what's happening behind you and a great way to remain unobtrusive so if you want to jump out and grab some food um, if there was a little fish or a little crab swimming past they might not even know that this particular animal is there so that's a lovely example of being cryptic so when we talk about cryptic critters, what does that actually mean? There are many different definitions of what a cryptic critter is, but um, I guess a blanket definition would be animals that use crypts to avoid observation or detection. So that can be interpreted in many different ways. A great example is resemblance to surroundings. So basically animals that look like the habitat that they're in. And that's a great way to hide yourself if you might be eaten, for example. So if you're, um, you're a prey species, you might want to hide yourself from predators but it's equally a useful thing to do if you're a predator because that way you can be present in the environment and very close to what you want to eat without it even being aware that you're there so the flounder like the one we just saw in that little motion before is an excellent example here's one from uh, merino rocks here and it really just looks like a little lump of sandstone you can see some little lumps of sandstone right next to it this is a juvenile one so looking like your surroundings is a great way to remain cryptic being camouflaged it's a very very good adaptation another one is having changeable skin color and lots of fishes and other marine animals can do that in the fish's case through little pigment cells called melanophores and I particularly wanted to talk about weed fish tonight because they are so diverse in South Australia and they come in so many different colours and patterns and they can change those colours and patterns at will, which is a very useful thing to be able to do. Another way of um, being cryptic is to be transparent so that other animals just can't see you. And here's a great example here, picture from Dan of the um, Charybdia rastani, the so-called jimbal. This is a southern relative of the tropical box jellyfish, fortunately not as poisonous, um, but they're really hard to see. And in summer in South Australian waters, particularly in the gulfs and Investigator Strait, there are very, very many of them. And often towards uh, the late afternoon, they start swimming up into the water, uh, into the water column. And often on those hot afternoons and evenings when you see kids running out of the, the water screaming, mommy, the sea bit me. Um, it's quite likely to have been one of these critters here with their four pink tentacles. There are other bitey critters that are very hard to see, but that's probably one of the most common ones. The other very effective means of camouflage is counter shading, where you're dark on top and light on the bottom. And um, penguins are a great example of animals that have counter shading. Um, and you probably notice that white sharks are like that and many different fish species. Um, if an animal is dark on top and a predator is looking down into the water column, it actually looks quite dark when you're looking from the surface down into the depths. So it's very hard to see an animal in that way. And equally, if you're on the bottom and you're looking up at an animal, if it has a white stomach, a white ventral side um, against the sunlit surface, it's really a lot harder to see that animal. So counter shading is another great way of remaining cryptic. Okay, next one. Um, being nocturnally active, that's another great example. Uh, this picture by Crystal of this beautiful little sea mouse here, they're not always only found at night, but they tend to be more active at night. A sea mouse is actually a type of polychaete worm and it's got these wonderful seti which are iridescent and they have really interesting fiber optic uh, properties as well. Another example of a nocturnally active species is this Indo-Pacific box jellyfish. This picture by Drew Jeffrey is an interesting one. It's a brown spotted jellyfish, normally just hiding down on the seafloor during the day and you can't really see them, but they are active at night. So this picture was taken at night 
Um, males and females apparently have a mating ritual, which is really odd for jellyfishes because they're very simple animals. But most people don't see these Indo-Pacific box jellies here in South Australia because not that many people dive at night. Um, we're not going to have too many slides with lots of information on, but we're still going through the introduction of what does it mean to be a cryptic critter. So we'll uh, look at a few other definitions as well. Cryptic critters might live inside rock spaces, so just in little cracks in the rocks, or it might live under the rocks or around the sides of rocks, or they might live inside invertebrates such as sponges. And here's an example um, from Port Julia of a ribbon worm, which is a, a muscular, unsegmented type of worm. This was actually a really bright, almost fluoro purple colour, but it's not obvious in this picture, about 20 centimetres long. This was inside a floating sponge that had been uprooted by a storm and it was just floating near the seashore there. Another way of being cryptic is being really small. Um, don't know if you can see that little tiny Meridiastra sea star there. Um, the black blob next to it is my index finger. So you can see that that animal is really quite small and very hard to see. Um, and that's a useful way of protecting yourself if you're quite small. I'm not going to talk much about cryptic speciation, but if you do a Google search of cryptic animals, that is likely what will come up. So cryptic speciation, it is important. It's not the subject of this presentation, but there are many animals that have um, very similar appearance, but genetically they're quite distinct. So if an animal was originally thought to have a broad global distribution um, based on its appearance, if work was done on the genetics of that animal, they might find that they are actually quite distinct populations that don't mix. And that has quite significant consequences for conservation because if an animal is only found in a small specific area and the populations don't mix, um, that is of greater conservation significance than an animal that has very widespread um, distribution. And here's an example here of this particular sea slug. Um, and a paper was written recently uh, separating this widely distributed species into individuals. Okay, so back to these wonderful flatfishes, the flounder and sole. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about them because um, they're all over South Australia. They're in uh, particularly in sandy areas. Here's a couple just from the local area here around Brighton and Glenelg. These are juveniles here. And here's one by Matt Tank showing these wonderful mottled patterns here of light and dark. So that's very well camouflaged on the seafloor where you've got these little bits of algae here. These are weird animals because when they're born, um, they have eyes on either side of their head like fishes usually do. But as they grow, one eye will migrate over to the other side of the head so that they have two eyes, either on the left side or the right side. And that divides the different groups of, of flounders. And normally, if I was uh, with a live, um, a live audience, I would ask them, why wouldn't you have an eye on the underneath if you were a flatfish? And um, people could write in the comment box if they want to, but your eye would get scratched all day long. If you were, if you were swimming along the seafloor with an eye underneath, that would be very painful. So good idea to have your eyes on top if you're a flounder and you can look around and just sit there and pretend that you're not there and then grab your prey. And that's called ambush predation. Um, so uh, the, the prey will come up very close, not knowing that the ambush predator is even there. Um, sit and wait predation. Okay, so I wanted to uh, introduce Emma Monceau, um, who is our first artist this evening. And Emma's made a beautiful Southern Soul plate. You can see some pictures of Southern Soul here. Here's a photograph of Nigel Ma by Nigel Marsh and this uh, illustration by um, Edgar Waite um, from back in the 1920s. So I'll play Emma's video now and she can tell you about the beautiful patterns on her plate and what inspires her. Thank you, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Motso. I'm an artist from South Australia. I make abstract art inspired by nature. Most of my artwork is inspired by the marine and coastal environment and the plants and animals that live in those environments. As an abstract artist, I'm not trying to recreate nature. I'm inspired by the colours, the patterns and the forms. Um, 
I work across a range of different material and one of the materials I love to use is glass. This is a glass plate that I made recently. And this plate was inspired by a flatfish called a southern sole. The southern sole lays on the sea floor, so it has a very subtle colour and pattern to camouflage with the sand. And um, I looked at some underwater photographs of southern soles to, um, to decide on the colours and how I laid out the pieces of glass to produce this glass plate. Thank you. That is beautiful. And um, that plate is available for sale, I believe, um, uh, on the Force of Nature website, um, along with um, other works by both uh, Emma and Dan. Um, thank you very much, Emma, for producing that. Um, that was made just last week for this particular series. So thanks again, Emma. Hi. OK, here is the plate up close. Uh, showing those beautiful white patterns on the top and also the black speckling, um, which is characteristic of the southern sole in its habitat, where it's got lots of different types of uh, small sand grains and also shells, um, broken up shell rubble as well. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to say a little bit about weed fishes because they are... Um, a very good example of well camouflaged animals that can change their colour um, to suit the environment that they're in. So there's some examples here. Um, this particular green one isn't looking very well camouflaged, but right next to where I took this photo was some very bright green calerpa algae. So this fish would have just come off the calerpa into the other algae. Uh, there's another green example here. And this little one down here, um, a photograph down near Cape Jervis, there's some uh, pink coralline seaweed here and you can see the fins also resemble the coralline seaweed and there's little holes in the fin that helps to break up the outline of the animal to, which assists in camouflage and the animal was actually the same colour as um, this pink seaweed in the environment there and you can see this one is particularly chunky looking that's possibly because well either it's had a feed or else it's a female carrying eggs and these particular animals are ovoviviparous that's a long 50 cent word which means that the eggs develop inside the mother and these are also known as super fetate animals which means that they can have eggs uh, and embryos developing at different stages at the one time. And the great thing about the camouflage in these animals is that the males are often brown um, because they look after a nest and the nests are often in brown algae. So the females can change to green or red, depending on the type of algae that they are in and brown as well. But um, some studies, in which these animals were moved into different habitats and different coloured algal habitats, uh, found that it was only the females that changed to green and red. And that is because they are likely to be more wide ranging than the males. So the males are stay at home dads looking after the nest in the brown, the bigger brown seaweeds, while the females uh, might be out uh, roaming around. This particular one was on a jetty here and it was pretty much similar to uh, what was growing on the jetty um, surface and I only saw it because of the this particular parasite there's a large female craniola parasite there and a little male next to her and these are quite nasty um, and very common in the South Australian marine environment those of you who are divers would have seen these on lots of different fish species and also on rays. Um, Another great example here from Johnny Becker. So this particular little cooter's weed fish um, is almost uh, translucent. Um, it's a very pale colour as well. And that, uh, that was on the seafloor at Edithburg and there's a sailfin goby there and the goby was probably just shuffing along and didn't even notice this particular fish. And it just got eaten um, so yeah head first there it goes goodbye to the goby and this is another great example here um, showing uh, the fish is actually wrapped around a sponge there and it's got that mottled face that looks very similar to the edge of the sponge don't want to talk too much about weed fish other than the fact that um, because 
they have nests and uh, they don't have uh, eggs and larvae, uh, sorry, eggs and sperm that are distributed in the water. They actually have internal fertilization, which is kind of rare for a fish. Um, we have lots of different species, so they don't have a chance to disperse very much. So lots of localised populations. So there's, um, yeah, well over a dozen species in South Australia here and about 27 species in Southern Australia. I wanted to show this because these are all exactly the same species. So this gives a good example of how varied the camouflage is in this animal, except for these stripy numbers at the top, and that may be a signalling mechanism. Um, whereby they are possibly um, showing their stripes to look for mates. I'm not quite sure, but um, that's very ineffective uh, when they're on sandy surfaces anyway in terms of camouflage. But in other examples, when they make themselves pale, they are quite hard to see. So thank you um, to all the photographers, particularly David Muirhead, who loves to photograph weed fishes in the shallows, and he's got quite a lot of good examples of these species. Okay, another one that has a similar type of habitat down on the seafloor is the painted stinkfish. And I wanted to include this because it's a great example of disruption. So it's got this stripy pattern here where it's dark on the side and light on the top with speckles. So if you were looking down from the surface, it would be quite hard to see this animal because it's very similar to the sandy environment there. But if you're looking at it from the side and you've also got dead seaweed and other, and maybe small dark rocks and other dark objects, um, having a dark side like that breaks up the outline of the fish and makes it harder to see. So if you're looking from a distance, it could just look like a little piece of dead seagrass or something like that. Here's another example here. Um, this one I photographed at Port Nolunga. I don't know if you can see the mouse here, but this one had a bright white head, um, but the snout area was dark grey. And that breaks up again the outline of the fish so it's very hard to see the shape of the fish this one was actually three different blocks of color so that's a very good example of disruptive coloration very similar to giraffes and cheetahs in the savannah in the dappled light they've got the dark and light patterns it's very hard to see them uh, in those kind of environments so this particular animal when the painted stinkfish is seen up close and i've got an example here from down at moana you can see it actually has quite a lot of different colours, pinks and blues and golds up close. But when you're looking at the animal from a distance, really quite well camouflaged. Here's another example um, that Adrian Brown took on one of our field trips over to York Peninsula. Again, it's got this lovely speckled pattern on the top that looks really similar to the sand around it. And there's one showing the male in uh, summer, in breeding season. They have this beautiful golden orange head there um, to show that they're, um, they're available. Okay, so we want to have a look at some of the angler fishes as well, because they are amazing in terms of camouflage. They really this particular one just looks like a hunk of seaweed and there are other species as divers in South Australia well know that look like little hunks of sponge as well. So um, this particular one has all these wonderful thin fleshy appendages um, that uh, are on the whole surface of the body and also on the fins. So it looks like red seaweed and uh, these ones the female lays the eggs uh, attached to rocky surfaces and they are guarded by the male. Like all angler fishes, they have a lure. So here's a great example of the lure in action here, looking like uh, worms. So this is another ambush predator. So uh, just sits there, I'm a seaweed, I'm a seaweed, I'm a seaweed, Oof! and then grabs the prey with these wonderful sharp teeth that you can see here. This was a dead example that washed up on the beach. Um, I'll show you an example here. This is from a long time ago when uh, Helen Crawford and I were diving down at um, Encounter Bay and I put my hand on seaweed at about nine metres deep, which was this uh, red placanium here. And I didn't realise this animal was actually in it. And here it is. So <laughs> it shocked us when we first saw it because they're often just sitting around on the seafloor and not moving very far. 
with this particular tassel and the fish. Um, got a bit of a fight and so did we. Um, and it decided to swim away and um, we decided to follow it. <laughs> and you can see the um, lure there looking a little bit like two worms drawn together. And then it's just going to settle down on the sea floor. So thank you very much to Helen for that video. Alrighty, we're going to meet a couple of other artists in a minute when we talk about leafy sea dragons because these are really masterful at camouflage. They're very iconic animals that people from all over the world come to South Australia uh, to see and I'm sure when COVID lifts people will be happy to come back from interstate and overseas to see the sea dragons here. We are very lucky to have leafy sea dragons here because they're only found here in South Australia and also in Western Australia, this particular species of sea dragon. And I wanted to include this video by Anthony King because it shows the way that sea dragons move. Not only are they really well camouflaged against seaweed with all these leafy appendages, they actually move in the same way that the seaweed moves according to the prevailing surge or the currents in the area where they are. And that is a great way of camouflaging yourself as well, is to pretend that you're part of the environment. So they have these very graceful movements, uh, which are very helpful in terms of their camouflage. And sometimes if they're hiding in either seagrass or in seaweed, they are really very hard to see. They're often found at the edges of seagrass beds or at the edges of reef or near solid structures, vertical structures such as jetties. So often in areas where their food aggregates, the little crustaceans called mycids. And um, this is a lovely example by Anita Futura showing um, the appendages on this, uh, this particular species and how well camouflaged they are. When they're young, this picture here by Ralph shows that they are really, really quite thin. So these ones are often in shallower water than the adults and they drift around um, often with dislodged algae or seagrass. So they are very hard to see. And as they get older, their body deepens. But the, the juveniles, very, very thin and small as well. So very good way of protecting themselves. Um, I wanted to show this example from Rapid Bay as well because we've been working on a project since 2013 to identify individual sea dragons based on their facial markings because just as you have individual fingerprints which make you you and no one else, um, sea dragons have individual patterns as well on their face and their head, on their snout, and also the shape of their appendages, particularly the head appendage, and we use the first ventral appendage as well, um, which can sometimes change a bit over time. But what we found from looking at thousands and thousands of photos of these animals is that um, they remain in an area for a really long period, up to years. So this particular one was older than six years at the time when we stopped recording it. We have some more recent photos now over the past three years. So we're gonna try and match those up and see if wishbone is still around. Over time, they can get damaged. Wishbone lost some appendages here. Um, and, and we had many photos of this particular animal so we could actually trace when he lost his appendages. And he bred quite late in life in 2016. We have examples of wishbone from years before, but he didn't breed in those, in those years. Um, so that's a, a good example of the need for camouflage because if you stay in an area for a long period and you don't move very far, um, you really want to protect yourself. So uh, our second artist this evening is Leela Fletcher and Leela is here with us tonight. Hello, Leela. Um, I wanted to show Leela's beautiful picture here, which has some great outlines as well to show um, the shapes of the appendages um, because these are such an excellent form of camouflage for this particular animal. So this is a front on view here showing the snout. And we've got Leela describing her artwork coming up right now. Thank you, Leela. 
Hi, I'm Leela Fletcher, and this is my watercolour painting of the beautiful and majestic Leafy Sea Dragon. I don't think I could have picked a more challenging angle to try to capture. I had to use numerous uh, reference pictures, but primarily I used a photo that Carl from Experiencing Marine Sanctuaries took on one of his dives. Um, another thing I found actually really useful and captivating is watching footage of them in their environment. Um, they really do resemble seaweed and are quite beautiful. Uh, I use different colours to outline the sections um, from the front to the back to help define the areas to uh, give it depth and uh, I think that worked out quite well. Um, I really enjoyed doing this painting and I'm very happy to be part of this Marine Life Through Art and Imagery project. Thanks. Thank you, Leela. I agree with you. I think it worked out really well. It's lovely and it does have a lot of depth. It's almost got a three-dimensional nature because you can see the appendages in front and behind of the body there. That is a really beautiful example of Leafy Sea Dragon artwork. Okay, um, I also wanted to mention Sue Lu, also known as Wildcard Sue's work, because Sue has been um, working on leafy sea dragon art and um, Australian native wildlife for several years now. She has a special interest in marine life, but she also uh, paints and uh, uh, draws animals um, from the land and also birds. And uh, she discovered a few years ago that she could draw very realistically from observation. Um, so she likes to dive and study and film and photograph the animals before drawing them. And it happened that this particular sea dragon called Carl was the first one that Sue drew. Uh, and here is Carly a little bit later that was done. Um, the first one was done with artline pens and occasionally uh, Sue also uses grey Tombow pens. And more recently she started to incorporate colour into her work using the coloured Tombow pens. And this is a great example of um, the camouflage colours that leafy sea dragons have with these olive colours here and that beautiful kelpie colour. So thank you very much, Sue. Um, Sue also produces greeting cards and educational colouring in sheets and a lot of other um, art materials. So uh, look out for Sue in further presentations as well. Um, Sue will be um, showing more of her artwork as part of this series. So thank you, Sue for um, providing this beautiful sea dragon artwork for us this evening. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna play a little game now uh, called Where's the Fish? So those of you who have an annotation button, um, which allows you to scribble on the screen, um, perhaps you'd like to find the fish and I'll just check if Carl is there. Carl, are you able to um set up the annotation so people can find the fish yeah that annotation should be live if you go to the top of your screen it says view options yes you click on that and just click on annotate then you can um draw on the actual page so everyone can see that okay can people draw on the page okay can anyone draw on the page i can draw on the page okay <laughs> Can anyone else draw on the page? Because oh, <laughs> there they are. Ooh, yeah, that's I right there. I can't see the thing yeah. on those lines. Ah, okay. Yep. There's an example there. There is one. And there is one. And Peter Porter. Yep, there's one. Anyone? Any takers for the one on the bottom left? Oh, yeah. Good, good idea. Person in blue and pink. <laughs> you found them. So these... Uh, again, very well camouflaged, small fishes that live down on the sea floor. Good on you. And thank you to those people who, <laughs> who have done that. And so it looks like your annotations have moved on to the Gobi page, but that's fine. I don't really know how to scribble them out, but oh, there they go. They're gone. So we're going to talk a little bit about gobies and sand gobies because there are so many of them. It's one of the largest fish families in the world, more than 
1,800 species and still being described as well. There's about a dozen different species of marine gobies here, including all of the sand gobies, the Nesogobius species. And a new one was described only a few years ago by Mike Hammer and uh, some, some associates called the tiger sand goby on Kangaroo Island. Sorry that I don't have a picture of that one. I wanted to include this sand sifter goby, even though this doesn't occur in South Australia, because I thought that was a really neat gift showing uh, the sediment going into the fish and then it's going out uh, uh, through the uh, under the aperclin cover there. Um, where the gills are. So it's, it's sifting through the sand. So gobies, they're all over the place. You'll find them in the shallows, um, off the beaches here in South Australia. Very important food sources for other animals, these little fishes, and they're all over the place. Lots of different gobies. Okay, so those of you who have annotation button, we're gonna look at where's the fish here as well. And we're onto a group of fishes that are a particular interest to me anyway, and to a number of divers, because they are quite hard to see and they are quite diverse and they're all over the place. Anyone find the fish on this page with your scribble button? No, yes, okay. Oh, nope, nope. Yes, a pink person in pink. Yes, good job. That particular one is, I'm very proud of that one because of finding that one because that's probably the first example of a juvenile knife snouted pipefish and they look very dissimilar to the adults. This one was bright green, but it had the characteristic knife shaped snout, the very long body, um, the really short head and the curved tail there. Um, so this one was just in the shallows um, off Glenelg there. Uh, thank you to all the people who have scribbled on there. Yes, there is another one there. Um, we have wide-bodied pipefish. This is a juvenile wide body, and it's not very wide at all. It's actually really thin. It just looks like a little piece of seaweed, a little frond or something. But it, you can see the eyes at the top there and the snout. And this one just hanging on here, uh, in the same orientation as a piece of dead uh, seagrass. And that's a really good way of camouflaging yourself as well. If you're a pipefish, by your colour, by your behaviour, by orienting yourself exactly the same way as the seaweeds that you're next to um, or the seagrass, um, and by being quite thin as well and small. So they are all really effective ways of camouflaging yourself. So they are great cryptic critters. There's quite a few species in South Australia. I wanted to give some examples of some of the ones um, that are found in the near shore area. This is wide body pipefish on the right. This is Briggs crested. This one came up and uh, whacked my camera lens. Um, so it's got this little snout there. And this is a relative of Briggs, this wonderful picture by Dave Muirhead here showing the rhino pipefish with his little horn there. So this particular pipefish found in the shallows, often in the dead seagrass detritus in this um, uh, particular um, seagrass, Posidonia here, the tapeweed. And it's actually got little pale white patterns on it that look a little bit like the calcareous algae that's on the dead seagrass. So incredibly good camouflage. And if you're walking through the shallows, it's quite possible that these animals are there, even in less than a metre of water. And um, you might not even know that they're there. They're really very, very cryptic. Uh, here's one that Anita Futterer photographed when we went to Glenelg recently. Um, it's, a, it's a, another wonderful example of a very cryptic pipefish. Um, it's probably a smooth pipefish, but we're not sure yet whether it's actually the Western Australian species prophet's pipefish. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to a little bit about habitats because as I mentioned, um, pipefishes are found all over South Australia in many different kinds of habitats and seagrass is one of the number one habitats for them. Um, very well camouflaged in strapweed here. Here's an example of a spotted pipefish. Uh, here's another one uh, orienting itself into, um, 
into the moving current because that's a good way of them getting their food. Um, and here's a photo that my daughter Jay took when we were diving over at Port Victoria. So again, this particular one is looks very, very similar to um, the seagrass in the environment where it is. That's a juvenile brush tail there. And on to um, our fourth artist this evening is Dan Monceau. And Dan is going to tell us a little bit about these wonderfully whimsical artworks that he's made. They remind me a little bit of Matisse's collages in the way that um, the material has been layered. We've got this little bite fish down the bottom here um, on the sand, looks like a vanacampus of some kind. And we've got this one a pale similar to some of the seagrass and then there's a little one hiding here as well. So this is a wonderful example of how well camouflaged these animals are in their environment. And here is what's possibly the most common pipefish species in South Australia in seagrass is the spotted pipefish with its beautiful black spots. And sometimes that's the way to find them is by looking at the eye. So there's some good example of pipefish eyes here in this beautiful tapeweed. So Dan's going to tell us a little bit about these artworks right now. Thank you, Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Monceau and I'm the maker of the two pipefish artworks you've just seen. Uh, I made these artworks using uh, pretty simple everyday materials. I use cut paper that I... Um, uh, produce using a plotter. So I draw the animals and then I use a machine to cut them perfectly. And, uh, and then the habitat you can see here, uh, I make out of washi tape. So that's uh, ready-made adhesive tape that already has those patterns on it. And uh, what I made these artworks for really is to help people uh, firstly recognise these animals because most people have never seen a pipe fish before. And also to see... Uh, to see how they present themselves in their natural habitat, which is seagrass beds, like what you see here. Um, I'm hoping that uh, other people will see them when they snorkel on, in or on seagrass, um, but they are well hidden, so look closely and you may well be rewarded. Thank you. Dan is absolutely right. They are well hidden and that is their aim, to remain well hidden as well. So as Dan mentioned, seagrass is a prime habitat for pipefishes. Um, another habitat that's very common is what's known as broken bottom or mixed habitat, where there may be a little bit of seagrass, a little bit of seaweed, such as the algae that you see here. There might also be sand patches and some shell rubble. These kind of environments uh, where you've got a mosaic of patches of habitats, um, particularly if there's some depressions um, as well in the sea floor are a wonderful environment for pipe fishes because that's where their food is like to collect as well. So here's some good examples of animals that live in mixed habitat here, including this uncommon species, Gale's pipe fish here, which has lots of little um, protrusions all over its body. It's also got very big eyes there. Um, there's a ringback pipe fish here and some Vanacampus species. Uh, found down in the rubble and another rhino pipefish looking very, very much like a piece of dead seagrass there. Um, but it's also found in um, seaweed environments as well as seagrass. Okay, um, I mentioned that animals can sometimes live in cryptic environments such as spaces between rocks and that's where um, some of the pipefishes live as well in little crevices um, and caves and under rock ledges as well and even in little gaps between the reef. So here's an example of a juvenile upside down pipefish that we found at Kangaroo Island and it's not actually upside down um, but when they are grown up that's what they look like on the left here. And they just live in caves and crevices upside down, um, often with the sawtooth pipefish in the same type of crevice habitat. And there are some places in South Australia where both of these species are found together. Same with the red pipefish found across Southern Australia, but very elusive. There are very, very few records. I have seen one and I don't have a photo but I know where it lives. <laughs> and they, again, are very well camouflaged in red algae and also in um, coralline pink algae and uh, crustose corallines, which coat the surface of um, the reef 
where they're often found. There may even be undescribed species of pipefish in deeper waters that, that haven't even been seen yet because they are so well hidden and deeper red algal beds in South Australia have not been uh, well surveyed because um, they're often in quite difficult to access habitats. So who knows what's out there? There could be lots of different pipefish species. I wanted to just quickly look at one that is a master of disguise. This is really small. Well, it grows to about 11 and a half centimetres, but they're often found much smaller. This is the hairy pipefish, so named because it's got all these little filaments that come off the body here. Um, not often seen, particularly by divers, because it's found in estuaries. So normally you'd have to go netting in estuaries and all pipefish species are protected in South Australia. So um, it's not advisable to go netting for pipefishes because it can be quite disturbing for them. They resemble the eelgrass leaves and the epiphytes um, in the environment that they live. They only live for about a year, quite, uh, quite a, a short time, like most pipefishes do. Um, and like others, the male broods the eggs um, in a little pouch. Okay, we're moving on to um, some bigger marine animals now. And normally if I was with a live audience, I would ask, what is this? And I'm not sure if people can answer this, but those of you who've been over to Cuttlefest or who have snorkeled with or dived with cuttlefishes at any time will know that it is a cuttlefish. So this particular example of the giant cuttlefish um, was one at uh, Fishery Bay that I photographed about 10 years ago. And as soon as it saw the divers, um, it, it positioned itself in this pose and um, curved uh, the tentacles and it also raised papillae in the skin, which is under the control of the nervous system um, and the muscle, muscular system. So it can happen very, very quickly. So whatever the animal perceives in the environment around it, it can camouflage itself very, very quickly um, using these papillae and also the colour. I, I don't think it did such a good job with the colour, but anyway, it was trying to present itself as seaweed, I think. It was even in the same orientation as the seaweeds around it. So cuttlefishes, again, they can be amazingly well camouflaged if they want to, or the opposite. They can be very, very flashy. There's about five or six species of cuttlefishes, but only one is commonly seen and known. And of course, that is the famous giant cuttlefish. In South Australia, we have the most important area in the world for the breeding aggregation of that species. It is very, very rare and precious. Um, here's another example of one trying to look a little bit like the sargassum next to it there. And another one here um, that Dave photographed again shaping up to him and trying to present itself possibly as something else these ones are not camouflaged these mating ones here uh, photographed by Eleanor Makashina um, shows some of the beautiful patterns that cuttlefishes can um, can present beautiful colors and patterns and I particularly wanted to show this video by Glenn Gitchen because Glenn was diving at night here and this particular cuttlefish um, was mimicking what it could perceive um, from Glenn's light source. So Glenn had a yellow filter um, on his camera and normally cuttlefishes would be this kind of uh, colour perhaps at night, but suddenly it turned bright yellow like the camera filter. And that's a really rare colour for this particular animal. Um, it's not often that anyone would see a bright yellow cuttlefish. So thank you, Glenn, for that amazing observation. It's, it's quite an uncommon thing to see. So how do they make all these amazing colours and patterns? By particular cells in the skin, there's several different types of pigment cells. They have chromatophores, which make these lovely warm colours like the browns and the reds and the oranges. They have the iridophores, which allow them to ref uh, reflect light and give the beautiful cooler colours like the, the mauves and the blues. And they also have leucophores, which uh, reflect all of the light. So um, they come out white and that enables them to make those wonderful stripy zebra patterns that you see on, on the tentacles and also on the mantle of these animals. So 
these particular skin cells, they can react in a split second. It's astonishing how fast they, that both the muscles and the nerves can act. Um, it's a little bit like if you have um, a balloon and you have uh, paint inside the balloon, and if you squeeze the bottom of the balloon, um, the balloon will get bigger at the top and all the paint will shoot up to the top. So that's similar to the way these pigment cells work. So they work on this expansion and contraction mechanism at a split second. Um, so the amazing ability of these animals to change colour and pattern very quickly. Okay, so we're on to our next artist for this evening. This is uh, Camilo Esparza. And Camilo has made this beautiful stamp with an example of the giant cuttlefish here. And it's showing some of the wonderful patterns and textures that this animal can produce in its rocky environment. So Camilo is going to talk about his artwork right now. Thank you, Camilo, for providing this. Hi everyone, my name is Camilo Esparza and I am the um, artist uh, who designed the cuttlefish um, stamp for South Australia. Uh, this is basically one of the designs uh, that I really like and it's inspired in the wonderful cuttlefish that come to Ayala, South Australia every year to breed and um, searching for love. So this is one of the designs that really inspired me um, to do a lot of marine life art and paintings and printmaking um, that is um, one of my passions that I uh, work with, I had the experience of swimming with a giant cuttlefish earlier this month, and I'm definitely inspired to do um, more designs from these wonderful creatures. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for being part of this wonderful series of talks. If you want more information, please visit me on my Instagram account, uh, Camilo Artist Blog, and, and also my WordPress um, account, Camilo Artist Blog, as well. So thank you very much and. Uh, keep doing the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you very much, Camilo, for the wonderful print. Um, really happy to see that. And we look forward to seeing more of your work throughout the series. Thank you for presenting. Okay, so going from bigger animals such as cuttlefish down to little animals. We talked about the fact that some of these animals can hide under rocks and some of the nudibranchs, which are sea slugs that don't have a shell in South Australia, they spend their whole life living under a rock, living on sponges under a rock and eating sponges and looking like sponges and they don't get out much. Sounds pretty boring, doesn't it? So here's some great examples. Here's a beautiful pink sponge here. And this is Rostanger, has uh, the same kind of little holy patterns on top. So it looks very much like um, the holes in the sponge. Um, here's some examples here from the metropolitan area, um, rocky beaches down south. This is the Scleridorus. We're not actually sure which Scleridorus this is. It doesn't have a species name. Uh, if it is a South Australian species, but it's quite possible that it is introduced um, because it's found in a number of areas where other introduced species occur. And it's really quite prolific. And the more we look, the more we find of these particular things. So some of these animals um, take up the compounds from the sponges that they eat as well. And that's another great way of protecting yourself because if sponges have some very distasteful compounds in them, um, you're not likely to be eaten. Um, here's one here, another one that doesn't have a name yet called the Edith Berg Doris that was named by Neville Coleman because I think the first one was found at Edith Berg there. And that's a really kind of nondescript brown warty type of sea slug, uh, very dissimilar to the common uh, species that people know about, the really beautiful, brightly colored, stripy and spotty species. Okay. Another sea slug here that is iconic within South Australia is um, the Verco's nudibranch. And this particular pink spiky sea slug lives on a pink sponge and it eats the pink sponge and it mates on the pink sponge. Uh, here's some wonderful examples here. There's one from Sean Ruxton here and Matt Tank. Uh, found in lots of different environments, basically wherever this sponge is. However, we've also found them in areas where we cannot see the sponge anywhere. 
whether these have been washed in from deeper waters or whether the, um, the younger ones are in shallow rock pools and then they move into deeper waters as they get older, we're really not sure. But we have found quite a number of them uh, nowhere near the sponge and we've actually looked around in the vicinity for the pink host sponge and not found any of it. So, um, yes, that's a bit of a mystery. So not always cryptic, but when they are on their pink sponge, really cryptic. Okay. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the presentation now, but I wanted to talk about sea stars because South Australia, sorry, what was that, Dan? Oh, um, sea stars um, are usually very showy and we have lots of bright species and they're often the first things that divers and snorkelers see when they go into the water because um, if they're red or orange and they've got the arms sticking out, they're, they're quite obvious in the environment. But many of the sea stars we have here in South Australia are not obvious at all. They're actually really quite small. We've got a number of species of Meridiastra here, really quite beautiful, delicate little animals. And they're very small as well. Here's one that looks like Nana's rug um, with lots of different colors and patterns all over it. And this one is of particular interest because um, I found this one down at O'Sullivan's Beach uh, in some algae and it was collected under permit for scientific study because this particular one is going to go over to Colombia um, and possibly be described because it's related to the paddle spine sea star from Victoria, which is the world's smallest sea star, but this is possibly a new species. And this is the first example of this particular animal. The whole sea star was only about five mils in diameter. And it's believed that that is the size of the adult, just as the paddle spine sea star, the Ala Stichaster Pamia, is also very, very small. Um, even as an adult. So they really don't grow much more than that. So this is a particular um, example here showing the tube feet. Sorry about the noise. Um, the birds in the background, we probably just want to get rid of those. There we go. Um, so this particular animal um, uh, shows the six arms. The other paddle spine sea star only has five arms. Um, so this is of particular interest to taxonomists because it hasn't been recorded before. Okay, so very cryptic because these little ones live under, um, under rocks or on rocks and are very small and hard to see. This is a, a great example here of Meridiastra fissura, which we don't find very commonly in South Australia here compared to the Eastern States. But thank you, Matt Tank, for that photo. Okay, I wanted to include these wonderful watercolour and pencil drawings from uh, Lesieur, who was on Baudin's voyage. He did all these. There was um, a lot of material collected here um, from around Australia when the French were exploring at the same time that Matthew Flinders was exploring as well. So Francois Perron was on the French voyage and Lesieur was the artist and he painted a lot of what Perron collected and it's now in a museum in southern France. That's one of my life ambitions is to go and see the Baudin voyage artwork and uh, recently um, there's been um, some research to go through all the old sea star paintings that were done in the early 1800s and compare them to modern species. And what they found is that um, some of the species are still, uh, they still have exactly the same name as they had back then. So such as the carpet sea star here, Meridiastra calca, and this common one that we find here um, in uh, South Australian Gulf, Meridiastra gunnii as well. So I wanted to include those because they were so finely detailed um, and there were very many sea star drawings done during those uh, voyages of exploration when the French and the English met here in South Australia in Encounter Bay, hence the name Encounter, and travelled around the coastline. Okay, um, we're on to tiny crabs now. I wanted to include some of these little flatback spider crabs because 
Um, there's quite a few species of them here in South Australia, but again, very well camouflaged, really hard to see. They can change colour. Sometimes they have uh, little bits of seaweed on them. Sometimes they don't. They're just plain like this one. Lots of different colours and they're very flat. So they can hide in little rock spaces as well, or they might be on rocks or on seaweed or sometimes in seagrass. So if you look really closely um, in the shallows, in rock pools, you're likely to see these kind of tiny cryptic crabs and they really don't grow more than about a centimetre across the carapace. Um, so much smaller than the, the, the crabs that people are commonly used to seeing here. Um, another type of crab I wanted to include is hermit crabs, because even though some of the larger hermit crabs we have here in South Australia are obvious um, when they have their big red claws sticking out, we also have some little species as well here. So this is Clary's hermit crab. So there's one that's taken over this particular shell. Um, and this is a very sad uh, picture of a Clary's hermit crab um, that had died. Um, and wasn't in its shell. Um, that was in a seaweed sample. And this one is even smaller, this little micropagurus here. So if you see uh, dead shells that are scooting along the sand in the shallows, it's quite likely that they have one of these tiny, tiny little um, micropagurus hermit crabs in. And I wanted to include Robin Herman's um, GIF here. Thank you, Robin, for producing this, because this is a really great example showing the amazing adaptations that these crabs have to living this kind of life inside a shell. So their back legs, you can see the back legs there, they're really reduced um, to, to a size where uh, they can help them hold on to the shell while they're in that particular shell. And then when they grow out of the shell, um, they will discard that one if the animal gets too big and then they'll take over another shell. Um, and it shows the animal here curled around the inner whorls of the shell. So it's a wonderful, safe compartment for these animals. So they are quite cryptic when they're hiding in their little shell houses there, the tiny hermit crabs. Okay, still on crustaceans, we've got isopods, which are incredibly important in the marine environment um, for many reasons, um, because they will break up detritus and eat dead and decaying things, but they'll also help to control seaweeds. They're also great food sources for other animals. So isopods, very, very important ecologically. Um, I wanted to include Widatia bakeri because um, these pictures by Mike Burrell show the amazing variation in the patterns and the colours of these particular isopods. Isopods being small crustaceans, um, and uh, they're also known as sea lice. Uh, these ones are sea centipedes, but there are other kinds called sea lice that sometimes uh, bite um, if, if you're in, in the water where there's a lot of sea lice. This particular one um, I found in American River. This one lives on seaweed, uh, sorry, on seagrass, and it's really quite well camouflaged. It's very flat, like the seagrass blade, um, and it's the same colour as well. Um, a number of different um, sea lice live in kelp, so here's, um, and other seaweeds. Here's one that's found in Sargassum sample. This is a paradotia species of kelp lice and these are extremely abundant. They are everywhere. So great food sources for fishes and for other animals as well. Um, also extremely well camouflaged because they're the same colour as the seaweed that they live in. Still on the crustaceans, we've got these crabs uh, cryptic decorator crabs. These ones are quite small, these uh, Skyzophrys rufescens. Sometimes the only thing you can see are their little red claws sticking out. Here's an example here that Dan took, um, that Dan photographed. There's the claws sticking out there, but would be quite well camouflaged if they're not moving. These particular ones can chop off little pieces of sponge and then stick them all over the top of their carapace here. Here's an example that's got little bits of sponge on its carapace and also on its legs. And here's one um, I found that was dead. So that's just the shell, the carapace that's been 
um, discarded and the animal has, uh, has grown a new one. Uh, this, this shows the shape of the animal without its very effective camouflage. And sometimes the sponges that they put on themselves have compounds in that are quite distasteful. So that's another great way of protecting yourself, not only hiding under sponges, but also having distasteful sponges um, that other animals don't like to eat. And here's a lovely gif here as well, um, showing a um, decorated crab trying to put a little piece of coralline algae on itself. It's not actually doing a very good job, but I hope it managed to do that. Okay, we're almost at the end of the presentation. This is just about uh, three slides from the end. We're going from the little things now, such as those hermit crabs, to bigger things, such as the electric rays. And the electric rays are quite well camouflaged if they're hiding in the sand. And here's a great example of an octopus moving along, moving along, moving along. And there's an electric ray in there. Oops, I don't think it ends very well for that particular octopus and it's inked itself everywhere it is really a shocking experience um, we have three different kinds of electric rays here in south australia the coffin ray the tasmanian numbfish and the short tailed torpedo ray and they're often hiding in the day down in sand and sandy rubble environments but um they can also be found in quite deep water and for the short tail torpedo ray down into the continental slope waters, 750 metres deep. That's pretty deep. And these particular animals have electric charge. So positive charge on the top surface, negative charge underneath, and they really can be quite shocking. So the numbfish, the Tasmanian numbfish, not too bad, but torpedo ray up to 220 volts. And that would be quite painful. And these are interesting rays because they give birth to live young. Um, there's quite a few of them in deeper waters, as I said, and so they tend to come up in trawl fisheries as well. Um, and I also wanted to show Warwick Moise's beautiful little example of a baby here. That's Warwick's thumb there. So you can see how small this particular baby electric ray is here. Um, and I don't think that was a very shocking experience. I wanted to include Joris Hofnagel, who's a Dutch artist um, from the 16th century, because he has got some really beautiful examples here of electric rays. Um, that he painted. He uh, was a painter and a printmaker and a miniaturist, a designer, a person of many talents, but he did lots of marine environmental art as well. We're going to finish off with an electric ray and here it is. This is Dan Monceau's example of an electric ray, this very funny representation that he made last week for this event and um, I'll let Dan explain what he's made here. Um, it's very cute. Okay so we'll go on to the next one. Thank you Dan for making this electric ray. So this artwork here is a comical take on an electric ray. The common names uh, that people know them by are coffin ray or numbfish. Um, numbfish because if you get uh, if you contact one of these, you'll know about it and your limb may be numb for uh, several minutes. The shock is enough to knock a grown man off his feet. So uh, so this cute little um, pancake-like fish um, has a belter of a shock and it's hidden in sand by day, so you can easily come upon one without necessarily knowing it. As happened to uh, Alexia Stipendio when we were diving together back in 2014 at Wyala. So here we have LED lights that I've uh, placed as eyes um, and, uh, and at the back here where the dorsal fin would uh, ordinarily be I've used a, uh, a piece of old circuit board uh, from a video card and, uh, and I've put some hazard warning tape there over the midriff of the animal just to uh, remind people of the electrical charge in a subtle <laughs> comical way. Thank you Dan. <laughs> Definitely something that you don't want to meet in the water without knowing about it. <laughs> okay, so um, I might finish there and say thank you very much. I'm hoping that Dan or Carl will have a talk about the Totally Immersed exhibition that is coming up later uh, this year and also the rest of the marine themed 
uh, talks that we have um, and the artistic expressions of interest. So I'll leave this uh, poster up um, at the end here, but I also wanted to say thank you very much for watching and listening. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm very happy to take those a bit later. Um, I'll leave the poster up and then I'll hand you over to Dan and say thank you very much for tuning in this evening. Cheerio. Thanks, Dan. Great. Thanks, Janine. The talk was excellent. Um, here's the uh, flyer for the coming exhibition. And if you haven't already uh, been made aware, uh, we're currently canvassing for artists and artworks to include in future talks like this one, and we'll have at least seven more before the season ends. Uh, if you'd like to show us your work, uh, all you need to do is visit uh, a website, which uh, is right at the top of the chat stream in uh, the Zoom chat. And uh, I'm sure Emma is just adding to the, um, to the chat stream and Facebook as well. So bit.ly bit slash totally immersed. Uh, so what we're looking for is absolutely anything that picks up on uh, or references or is inspired by South Australian marine life. And that includes some of the um, more distributed animals that, um, that may be migratory and, uh, and travel vast distances, things like as big as a great white shark or, um, uh, or a, a, as migratory as a tuna or a kingfish, whatever, um, whatever piques your imagination. And there are two opportunities. One of them is to contribute to the talks, as I mentioned before, and the other is an end of year exhibition and special event that, uh, that we're planning at the moment. We've got some, uh, some exciting things in the pipe regarding that, but um, nothing firm enough to announce just at this time. So if you would like to contribute, please um, fill out the entry form at that link I mentioned and, uh, and send us some examples of your work and some links where we can look at more of your work. And our uh, little curatorial team will pour over those and we'll send you a message uh, if your work's been selected to include in one of the talks like this one. Thanks, Janina. It was a great talk. I always learn a lot during our presentations. And I think a lot of other people have learned a few things from tonight going by the, uh, the comments on the page. Okay. I didn't, I've, had, I've seen sea mice before um, at night, but I didn't know they were polychaete worms. So that was a, that was a new one for me. Um, just talking about the numb fish just reminds me of my dad back in the 80s when I went diving with him. He just jumped out this, off the sand one day and he was a numb fish. So he got a big jolt of electricity. So I thought that was quite funny as a teenager. Um, just like to say thank you to everyone, um, especially the artists tonight as well. Like there's some really beautiful artwork there tonight. I look forward to seeing a lot more artwork to go with future presentations. And thank you very much, Janine, for your presentation tonight. Oh, you're thank you. Um, force of nature and yeah dan and emma for their support in the background to coordinate these sessions it's been really helpful for me being underwater with the cuttlefish for the last month to be able to put into yeah dan's good hands so thank you for that dan and i look forward to announcing future presentations in the near future